When seven-year-old Anna goes to school, she doesn't pack textbooks, she takes a rope and harness. After a steep climb down a muddy slope, she and her friends must cross a dangerous, fast-flowing river. Like most villagers here, the families can't afford to build a footbridge. So the children have to slide across by cable. Anna's grandfather Arka comes along to make sure she gets there safely. China may have put a man in space, but these folk have more modest dreams. The villagers are ethnic Lisu, one of the poorest, most forgotten and most extraordinary communities in China. They've lived in these remote river valleys near Tibet for perhaps a thousand years, speaking their own language and following their own customs. Despite centuries of Chinese rule, it feels like a different country. Boucher, with just 84 residents, is typical of the isolation. Visitors are rare, tourists non-existent, and nobody gets in without help. This side of the river has the road and village store as well as the school. But most of the village has always lived on the other side. For generations, they used a bamboo rope to cross. The 1960s brought a wire cable. It might be fun the first time, but this is what most people here have to do every day of their lives. Half a century after the revolution, villages like this still lack basic amenities. Beyond China's booming cities, the reality in the countryside, particularly for ethnic minorities, is that life is as hard as the land is beautiful. Most of the Lisu scratch a living from small plots of land on the hillside. Arkai is the elected village leader, but that doesn't give him any privileges. He and his wife Annie can barely survive on the corn and barley they grow. But poverty doesn't stop their hospitality. 
Annie put on her full ceremonial dress for our visit to their home, a simple bamboo hut they built themselves. It's also home to two pigs, a herd of goats, several chickens and their granddaughter Anna. Before we knew what was happening, Arkai slaughtered one of his precious chickens for us. And he spends every spare hour trying to supplement their meagre income, making traditional mats and bags to earn a few dollars at market. The Lisu have little access to China's new economy of export manufacturing and high-rise construction. The only jobs near the village are low-paid labouring work. It's a common problem in rural China, but the Lisu have an added problem. Like many of China's 56 minority groups, few speak any Chinese. The national language Mandarin is as incomprehensible to them as their own language is to the rest of China. At the village school, children learn Mandarin as a foreign language. It's not just their one hope of finding jobs. The authorities see it as a way to promote national unity. Once a week, the children raise the flag of the People's Republic and sing the national anthem. Yuzan Zong is their ethnic Lisu principal. The first hour is spent reciting Mandarin. Even the teachers sometimes struggle with the words, switching back to Lisu so the children can follow. The three teachers are dedicated, but they lack even basic resources. The children have never even seen a computer. Our visit was the first time they'd seen a digital camera. E R son. The children are guaranteed free tuition until the age of 11. But it's still a struggle for the parents to find money for books, even shoes.
。哦，现在，呃，上级想了很多办法嘞。四六，哎，十四。That's a problem Anna's family is already facing. 阿吉的可多话，你少做那个。While Arkai looks sprightly, he's battling ill health. Frustrations with life on Earth have led many to look for rewards in heaven. Eighty percent of the Lisu are Baptist Christians. Missionaries came to the area a century ago, devising a Lisu script to translate the Bible. The congregations were oppressed during the Cultural Revolution. But after 1981, when the communist ban on religion was lifted, the entire village was baptized. Bo Yuxia is their Baptist pastor. Mahalis is Tili Mangabu. Ah, Mahalis is that. Eh, what is the Dong Ba Si Le Ho De Le Ho? Ah, they are Be Le Ho Sa Ke Jua. Ah, I know Sa Halis is that. I buy the De Le Ho Si Le Ho Ma Jua. The central government hasn't completely ignored their material needs. They built a road here in the 1960s and have now brought power to homes around the school, though not to the other side where most people live. Anyone prepared to walk an extra hour can cross a rickety bridge built further down the river, but it doesn't feel much safer than the cable in the village. Most use it only once a week to carry their goods to a nearby market. This is the one place they can see some benefit from China's economic reforms. I'm a good thing, yeah. You so come and check one and one, you know, but did you do my job? You heard me, me was a thing, my job. Good thing, yeah. You got him, but then I go for one, my dog, check the name of one, my dog. I'm going to get to you, lah. I know, check the name, did you do over the water? You didn't need to take over the water. But few can afford the new consumer goods like televisions or DVDs, and they don't have electricity for them anyway. So, to the disapproval of their pastor, Arkai and his friends seek entertainment the old-fashioned way. Home brewing is one of the oldest known traditions of the Lisu culture. At the end of a hard week, it's the prelude to an afternoon of storytelling and songs. But the changes taking place in the new China are straining the ties of this close-knit community. Annie and Arkai are bringing up their granddaughter after Anna's mother abandoned her for the lure of the city. 
They're determined to raise Anna in the Lisu ways. There is a rhythm to daily life here that has changed little in centuries. Revolution has come and gone with little effect. The benefits of capitalism have largely passed them by. As China marches ahead to economic and military might, the Lisu struggle to keep up with a world that is leaving them behind.